Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Well, how are you to, tonight? Good. Good. So half of you are doing good. The rest of you, well, we're glad you're here anyway. And uh, we hope you get comfortable. Let me tell you what you're in for, though. This is a Bible study. So I uh, hope you can settle in and uh, focus your mind, your attention for the next hour on the Word of God. That's what we do verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And we find ourselves in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So turn in your Bibles. I trust you brought one or you have access to one. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we have chapter 8 and 9 before us. Uh, but uh, we at least have chapter 8. Um, at least we have verse 1 of chapter 8 uh, ahead of us. But we have chapter 8 and 9 because they deal with the same topic. It's all part of the same section in this letter. So, a little background. Paul the Apostle, in his lifetime, made three great trips. We talk about mission trips. This guy covered the known world at the time. Three missionary journeys. Where he took the gospel from Antioch, Jerusalem, then Antioch, and across Asia Minor... And uh, with each time he penetrated a little bit further west till the gospel made its way into Europe. So great strides were being made. On Paul's third missionary journey, he takes a collection from the Gentile churches, non-Jewish churches, in some of those regions, Macedonia, and Achaia, Macedonia being uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Achaia being Corinth, that area. And he wants to take the finances collected there to support the brethren who are in Judea, the early church, the first church, the original church in Jerusalem, has been suffering greatly. So Paul takes up a collection, not for himself, but for the brethren in Judea. Now, what Paul does is sort of like foreign missions in reverse. What I mean by that is the sending church was the Jerusalem church. Jerusalem and Antioch were the two churches that sent people out from there. And because of them sending people out from there, the gospel ended up in these Gentile regions. But now these Gentile regions are going to support the original sending church. That's why I say it's like foreign missions in reverse. So you wonder, well, what is going on in Judea that re would require these churches who are the fruit of the original church to need to give money to it? Well, number one... Jobs. Most of the jobs in Jerusalem at the time were temple-oriented. The temple was the biggest enterprise going in the city of Jerusalem. The temple enterprise, which was enormous, was massive, uh, was run by a group of Jewish leaders known as the Sadducees. You've obviously heard of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the largest, most formidable enemy of the early church in Jerusalem. And here's why. The Sadducees were liberals. They didn't believe in miracles, didn't believe in angels, and they did not believe in resurrection. The early church had a singular message. Jesus came, died, and was raised from the dead. So because they preached the resurrection in virtually all of their sermons, the Sadducee party was their biggest enemy. 
and they controlled the jobs in Jerusalem. Now, during the ministry of Jesus, things were a little bit different. Jesus' biggest enemies were not the Sadducees, but the Pharisees, the legalists. But now that Jesus has died and the early church claims resurrection, now the biggest enemy are the Sadducees. So number one, jobs. And since the Sadducees controlled the temple enterprise, those who believed in Jesus, believed in the resurrection of Jesus, were losing their income, losing their jobs. Factor number two, in response to factor number one, the early church took their resources, sold their belongings, pooled the resources, so they had a common commonality between them. We're told in Acts chapter 2. Um, those who believed uh, sold their belongings and had all things in common. So they pooled their resources. But those resources only lasted a limited period of time. Those resources are now running out. So jobs were lost in response to that. People shared their resources. Those resources are dwindling. There's a third factor, and that is a famine hit really hard in Judea. Now, you know a little bit about this famine because in the 11th chapter of Acts, in Antioch, there was a prophet by the name of Agabus. Agabus was well known in Antioch, in Jerusalem, in Caesarea. And Agabus stood up and he predicted a famine is coming to the Mediterranean world. And it says, it came. The footnote in Acts says, and it happened. And because of that prophecy, wisely, the brethren in Antioch and the other churches decided, let's prepare to send relief to our brethren who are in Judea. It says that in Acts 11. So those were the three factors that caused Paul to make a huge issue of this, and he does. There's quite a number of chapters in his letters that are devoted to him receiving an offering for the poor saints in Judea. Now, one would wonder, why is Paul so personally invested in this? You could say, well, he was trained in Jerusalem. True, he was. He sat under Gamaliel, so he knew Judaism. But I think Paul is personally invested uh, in the early church in Jerusalem, not just because of his academic background, but at one time... He was their chief persecutor. He was the one who went after them. They laid the clothes, uh, uh, or the, the, the people who stoned Stephen laid their garments at the feet of Saul. Saul watched over them, and the very next chapter in Acts says, breathing out threats and slaughter against the church. So he was an antagonist against the early church in Jerusalem, and it was that antagonism that moved him north toward Damascus. And then Jesus interrupted him. It was a blessed interruption. So because of that, and Paul did reference this, he said, look, um, I'm the chiefest of sinners because I persecuted the church of God. So I think because of that background, Paul this is very personal to him, and he wants to ensure that the church in Jerusalem is supported since they were the original sending church. So he, he receives an offering. And uh, Paul writes a lot about finances in these two chapters. Now, just a note about finances in general. Just, we'll just clear the decks, clear the table. There is nothing in the Bible that says that wealth, prosperity, Resources is, is wrong in and of itself. Money is not evil. The Bible does not say money is evil. The Bible, if anything, says money is neutral. Money is neutral. It's not evil. Um, the Bible says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That's the actual scriptural reference. But money is not evil. Abraham was wealthy. He was so wealthy that his wealth was on a par with the kings and the rulers of Canaan. Abraham had 318 paid staff members, servants. Joseph 
was arguably the second wealthiest human being on earth at the time. And there are several instances. Job, God blessed him, the Bible says, with enormous wealth. Yes, he was tested. Yes, he lost everything. But it says God blessed at the end of his life even more than at the beginning. So there's nothing wrong with wealth. What's wrong is what you, what you do with it. If you use it wrongly, then it's wrong. If you use it rightly, then it's a blessing. It can be a blessing. It can be a curse. It's like a two-edged sword. So he pivots now in chapter 8, verse 1, says, Moreover, brethren, or also, brothers, I want to talk about something else. Moreover, brethren, we made known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. You read that and you go, wow, I'm, I'm interested now. What, what could Paul be referring to when he says, there's this special grace that God has given the churches over in Macedonia. What would it be? Here it is. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. What Paul says is the grace that God gave to these churches is the opportunity to give financially to the poor brethren who were in Judea. That was to be seen as a grace. That was to be seen as a blessing. But notice something about these Macedonians. It mentions great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and their deep poverty. They are getting hit hard. They are at the bottom of the barrel financially. Things are hard for the churches and, and the brethren, the believers in Macedonia, in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea. Those are the churches of Macedonia. Life is hard, and they are poor, and yet at the same time they have joy. Can two things be true at the same time? Of course. And these two things are true at the same time. Poverty, joy. You can be poor and happy. You can also be rich and miserable. Now, you can be rich and happy, and you can be poor and miserable, but you can also be poor and happy. And they were poor and afflicted and filled with joy. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. That is, the churches in Macedonia, I'm collecting this offering from you, Corinthians, as well as those Macedonian churches, they've already given. And it wasn't easy for them to give because they were afflicted and they were poor, but they did it joyfully even beyond the proportion that they were able to give. They, they gave more. They gave sacrificially. Now, you're going to, as we read through this, Paul is going to talk about this offering and say, look, I'm not commanding you to do this, and I don't want to lay a guilt trip on you to do this, but I do want you to know that these churches that I'm partnering with besides you see giving as an opportunity. And they do that with joy, and they give beyond their ability. There's an interesting principle in the Bible when it comes to giving of your time, of your talent, of your treasure. It's, it should, at some point, be sacrificial. It should cost you something. That's the principle David operated off of. When he wanted to find a suitable place to build the temple for the Lord, and there was a guy who had a threshing floor by the name of Ornan or Arana, depending on which of the two Old Testament passages you're reading, same guy. He goes, Ornan, I'd like to buy that piece of property on the top of the hill, the threshing floor. I want to build a temple for God. And Ornan says, oh, Dave, or your majesty, um, you're doing it for God. I'm not going to charge you. You can have it. Dave says, no, 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 no. Give me a fair price. Uh, you earn a living by uh, threshing out wheat on the threshing floor. Just tell me your price, name your price, and I'll pay it. No, 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 David. 
uh, King, Sir, Your Majesty, you're doing this for God. It's in worship for God. You want to build a temple for the Lord. I just think you should have it. You, I'll give it to you. And David put his foot down, and he said this, No, for I will not sacrifice to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Because then it's not a sacrifice. It's got to cost me something. I have to feel it. When Jesus was in the temple one day with his disciples, he saw a woman in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, put in two little coins into the treasury, into the offering box. Two mites. Now, two mites would tally up in today's money, in, in our uh, currency. Uh, two mites would be equal to about one-eighth of one cent. One-eighth of one cent. And Jesus saw her putting that in and says, you see that woman? She's put in more than everybody else. They gave out of their abundance she gave out of her poverty all that she has. So that is how these Macedonians were giving to the church in Jerusalem, according to their ability and beyond their ability. I remember as a kid when uh, in just the church community I was raised in, I, would, uh, I knew people who were, who were a, a part of that community, and, and I would hear so often when I would go to my friends' houses, and even in my own house, you know, we, you'd have stuff laying around that says, you know, we don't use that. That's just sort of junk. Let's just give it to the church. What a horrible thing to think and to say. Since we've used it and we no longer deem it as valuable, we consider it rather to be junk, let's give it to God. Instead of saying, God deserves my best. He deserves the best. Israel was to give the best lamb, a lamb without spot, without blemish, the best of the grain, the first fruits. So, God graced them, gave them an opportunity to give, and I bear witness according to their ability. Yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. It gets better. Verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You get the picture. The Macedonians, you know, we may have said, oh, well, you know, you guys are poor and you guys don't need to get involved. Oh, no, 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 really, Paul, we insist. We want to give. We're begging you. We want to be involved in this project, imploring us. And verse 5, and not only as we had hoped, and I love this verse, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. That's the key. You begin by giving yourself to the Lord. And once you give yourself to the Lord, if you have given yourself to the Lord, then you belong to him. And all that he allows you to use is his. And you are simply stewards of all that he has placed in your life, given to your hand. And so you begin by giving yourself to the Lord. And if you give yourself to the Lord, then God has access to everything. Everything. And then to us by the will of God. So, verse 6, we urged Titus. Remember, Titus was the guy that Paul had sent to Corinth to uh, bring the letter and to do the preliminary work to, for this offering. So we urged Titus, as he had begun so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Macedonians saw it as a great opportunity, a grace. Uh, you, you started this. You indicated that you wanted to be involved. Now, see it as a grace bestowed on you also. I've always been and 
probably will continue to be low-key when it comes to finances. It's how we started, and we've seen God provide. When we started, and we started just a few miles from here at a movie theater on Sunday mornings, before we had a Sunday morning, we had a Thursday night Bible study in an apartment gathering room at a nearby apartment complex. And the room was provided by the owners of the apartment complex. Those who ran it said, it's a Bible study. You don't have to pay anything for it. But we still wanted to buy coffee and desserts for people who came to our Bible study. So we had a little coffee can with a slit on top for people to put anything they would want in there to, to buy coffee and cookies. When we began our Sunday morning, and the question was, well, how are you going to receive the offering for Sunday morning? I thought, maybe two cans? One on each side of the movie theater? And that's what we did. We had a coffee can on one side, a coffee can on the other. And then when we moved into the building, we kept the can concept, only we decided to use what we call agape boxes. There they are in this sanctuary, scattered throughout. And we just thought, look, the Lord's provided pretty well through uh, cans, coffee cans. Uh, perhaps he'll provide through agape box. We'll just let people know that's where you can uh, give your tithes and offerings to the Lord. And let's just see what the Lord does. But we've always been that low key. Now, here's the reason why I started with the coffee can concept. When we moved here, I noticed that Albuquerque, New Mexico was on the geographic crossroads of two major freeways across country, north and south, east and west, I-25, I-40. People pass through here, not just people passing through here, but evangelists and tele-evangelists and ministries pass through here. And while we were just starting our church, and Lorraine, I have this memory because your parents uh, would tell me some of the stories. Um, there was a particular evangelist that had been coming through town and was taking exorbitant offerings using trash cans in his meetings. And he would tell the people, we're passing the trash can, we want them filled to the brim. And just pressuring people to give, to give, to give. And your parents told me that they got up one night and walked out. They were just fed up with it. They had the discernment that this is wrong. And as they were walking out, the evangelist from the stage called out and said, you wouldn't leave a restaurant without paying. And they knew right then, this guy's abusing his office. They, they told me that, and so I thought, coffee cans. We're going to use coffee. We'll use agape boxes and, and let the Lord do it that way. So I, I've always been low-key because I hate hype. You know, there are 20 people here with $20,000 or $2,000. The Lord is revealed. All that nonsense. I just hate that kind of hype. And I think God hates that kind of hype. So it's a grace. See it as a grace. If you don't see it as a grace, keep it. Don't worry about it. That's between you and God. Now, having said that, I will say a good indicator or one of the indicators, one of the barometers, one of the gauges of a person's spirituality is what they do with their finances. Take a tour of somebody's checkbook, somebody's bank account, and you will see what's important to them. Where a man's heart is, there will his treasure be also. But having said that, Paul wanted to give them the opportunity without forcing them into it. So complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, verse 7, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Now, a word about that verse, because Paul acknowledged that the Corinthian church had abundant resources and abundant 
giftings. He said, as you abound in everything, in faith, I think there were faith-filled people. They had faith in Jesus Christ. Besides faith in Jesus Christ, I believed, I believed that they expressed the gift of faith, the spiritual gift of faith. They had um, supernatural, unusual manifestations of faith in God. The gift of faith was used in that congregation. In speech, meaning in proclamation of the gospel, perhaps in the vocal gifts, prophecy, uh, tongues perhaps, interpretation. It's hard to know exactly what Paul is referring to. Probably those gifts. In knowledge, perhaps a reference to the word of knowledge, or it could be simply Bible knowledge. In all diligence and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace, the grace of giving also. In 1 Corinthians, the first letter that we have as 1 Corinthians, Paul did say, you come behind in no spiritual gift. He said that to the Corinthians. You come behind. You're not lacking in any spiritual gifts. You guys have the manifestation of all the gifts in your congregation. So he's probably acknowledging that here, saying you're gifted and graced in many areas, also excel in the grace of giving. And again, we should see it as a grace. I remember when I was uh, in, in medical training in, for radiology, we learned about the condition called cirrhosis of the liver. And it's a condition that happens to uh, people for a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons is if they uh, uh, consume too much alcohol, uh, it will compromise the system, and they'll get cirrhosis of the liver. But I've learned as a pastor, some people uh, could be diagnosed with cirrhosis of the giver. It's almost as if they get their hands are paralyzed when it comes to giving, but miraculously cured when it comes to buying something. It's amazing how it works. So excel in this grace also. I speak, verse 8, not by commandment. I'm not forcing you to do this, telling you you have to do it. But I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. That's why I compared the Macedonians who gave out of their poverty. I'm not saying you have to do this, but I'm saying here's a church that does not have the financial resources you do, Corinthians, and yet they've been so generous. Now, Corinth had more money. It was a, it was a, a bustling, busy uh, capital of commerce uh, in the ancient world. So a lot of resources were coming through it. So no doubt the church had more financial wherewithal. For you know, verse 9, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty, might become rich. You see what he's doing? He's saying, one example to you, Corinthians, on giving is the Macedonian church. But the ultimate example of giving is Jesus. He was rich. Uh, he is God the Son, second person of the Trinity. His home was and is now heaven. He left that glory and came to this earth. And when he came to this earth, he was born in poverty. His parents were poor. Mary and Joseph couldn't even afford a lamb for the dedication of their son in the temple, which was required by law. The stipulation the law allowed was that if you are poor and can't even afford the lamb offering, you can bring two turtle doves. That was the allowance. Mary and Joseph brought two turtle doves. They were poor. Jesus was born in a borrowed manger. He was put in a borrowed tomb when um, he wanted to give an example. He, didn't even, he couldn't reach in his pocket and grab money out. He said, hand me a coin. Held it up and said, whose image and superscription is on this? Caesar. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Another time... When taxes were due, and Jesus didn't have the money to pay the taxes, he just said, Peter, go down to the lake, pull out a fish. There'll be a coin in its mouth. It's pretty handy. 
handy guy to have around at, around this time of the year, right? So if your husband says, I'm going fishing, He was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. And a little cross-reference for you or to keep in mind or write in the margin of your Bible is Philippians chapter 2. Though being in the form of God or being in very nature God, he made himself of no reputation or he poured himself out to the very last drop, took on the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. So... He divested himself of the prerogatives of deity. That's what the theologians call that. He divested himself of the prerogatives of deity for a 33-year period. He became poor for your sakes, that you through his poverty might become rich, and how lavishly rich spiritually we have become. And in this, I give advice. Now, I like Paul. Paul says, I'm not commanding you but I do want to give you some advice about your money and about this offering because my advice is don't embarrass yourself. You're going to see that. Don't lag behind in something you promised to do last year and then when it comes around to it, you, you don't get involved in it and it would just be, it would be embarrassing for you. Prove your love. I give you this advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must also complete the doing of it, that as there was readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. So a year ago, a year ago, we talked about this. A year ago, you said, count me in. A year has passed. We're headed to Jerusalem. Step up to the plate. In most sports where you uh, use um, something in your hands to connect with a ball, like a golf club in golf or in tennis or in baseball, uh, they will tell you, to not only keep your eye on the ball, but what's important is to follow through. Follow through. Your follow through makes all the difference in the trajectory of the golf ball down the fairway, the tennis ball to the other side of the court for placement thereof, and for the baseball in a game. Follow through. So Paul is saying, now step up to the bat and follow through with your commitment that you made a year ago. And notice again in verse 12, it is accepted according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. So one of the um, principles in giving is proportion, proportion. Um, God is more concerned with proportion more than he is with portion. The amount doesn't matter to him. It's the proportion that you have. It's the heart that you have with that proportion um, more than, than the amount itself. Again, Jesus said, this woman put in more than everybody else, even though she put in one-eighth of a cent. It's not the amount. It's the proportion. For I do not mean, verse 13, that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be an equality. What does he mean by that? Well, he could mean you're giving now to the Jerusalem church. A time could come in the future where they have the finances and you find yourself in that poor situation and they need to support you. He could mean that. Um, or he could simply be talking materially versus spiritually. There's a principle in Romans chapter 15, where Paul writes to the Romans and says, look, if you have been partakers of their spiritual benefits, why shouldn't they be partaker of your material benefits? They've given to you spiritually, give back to them materially. So um, that could be the idea of, of inequality supplying their lack. As it is written, verse 15, as it is written, 
He who gathered much had nothing left over. He who gathered little had no lack. What is he quoting from? He's quoting from Exodus chapter 16 when God brought food from heaven. What was that food called? Manna. So God told them to go out every day and pick up manna, just enough for one day. It'll come the next day. Don't hoard it. Don't get too much. And what they notice is if they went out and picked up too much and just hoarded a whole bunch of it, it started to decay and stink. And they had to throw it out. And so what they would do if they got too much of it is they would share it with others. So gather enough for yourself. And if you can, share what you can with others. That's the principle out of Exodus chapter 16. He who gathered much had nothing left over. He who gathered little had no lack. Now, the early church practiced this idea of dispersing what they had to those in need. Again, Acts chapter 2, where it says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. That's common property, uh, common finances. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira sold land. They lied about it, but they, the idea is this was going on. People were selling things and pulling the resources together. So gather what you need and share what you can. But, verse 16, thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. Remember, Paul had been in Ephesus. Paul was on the move west, first to Troas, then to Macedonia. He sent Titus to Corinth with the letter, 2 Corinthians, and with the commission to ready them for a collection for the church in Jerusalem. What Paul is saying is, I didn't have to push or convince or cajole Titus into doing it. He volunteered for it. Maybe he said, you know, I really got to get this letter over to the Corinthians, and, and we should include them in the offering. Titus said, I'll go. And he had an earnest care for them uh, as much as Paul did. And I like that. You know, over the years, um, I've talked to people, and I've had a conversation that goes something like this. Well, how long have you been coming here? Well, I've been coming here for 10 years. Oh, great. And, and, and so t what, tell me about your interests, and are you involved in any ministries here in the, in the body? Well, no. But I, I'm, I guess I'm waiting for you to tell me. I go, well, you're going to be waiting a long time if you're waiting for me to tell you. Because, A, a I don't have the time to notice every single thing and figure out what you may or may not be gifted for. That's what our, our, uh, our, our life course is all about. But more than that, when a person has a heart to be available... They'll just look for an opportunity that sounds like it fits their gift mix. So Titus just said, yeah, I, I, I'd be good at that. I'll do that. I volunteer. I sign up. That's being available. So God's work is always available to you. Are you available to God's work? Isaiah the prophet said, here I am, Lord, send me. That's what God is waiting for. Just that, here I am, send me, use me. I offer my body as a living sacrifice. Go for it. So Titus stepped up. He accepted the exhortation, being more diligent. He went to you of his own accord. Verse 18, And we sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Who's he talking about? The brother. That's who he's talking about. Well, who's the brother? We don't know. He's not named. He's just anonymously called, you know, the brother. Whose praise is in the gospel. Whoever this brother was, obviously, look, Paul's putting a delegation together. Probably him, it is going to be himself, Titus, 
the brother, whoever that is, probably a delegate from the Macedonian churches. Some have guessed it's Apollos. Others have guessed it's Luke. Others have guessed it's Silas. Could be any of them. We don't know. He's not named. And sometimes I smile when you have people who aren't named because I wonder why would God do that? Uh, or why would Paul do that? Why didn't he just name him? He named Titus. Just name the brother. But maybe he just wanted theologians to have something to do. You know, to, to write a dissertation about or argue about in their commentaries. And because they, they have. They've been doing that. And uh, trying to argue for one or the other. We don't know. And if we needed to know, we would. But it's just some brother who obviously has a reputation because his praise in the gospel is known throughout all the churches. So somebody, somebody famous. Not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with his gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind, avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which was administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have proved diligent in many things. Now, this could be yet another unnamed brother, perhaps a Corinthian delegate. But now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. It's very obvious that when it came to financial matters, Paul was very careful. He did not want people to think, Paul's ma making money off this collection. You know, he's raising all of this income for the poor saints in Jerusalem. But look, you know, he's driving an eight-horse chariot and, and um, living high on logs. So Paul said, look, we're going to be very careful about the finances. And I think that every ministry should be very careful about the finances. Uh, we, every year, have an annual audit. Our uh, finances are looked at by an independent audit company, and they come in and they examine best practices. And if there's a red flag, they let us know. They let the accounting department know. They check for fraud. All our checks have to be signed by two signatures. Again, all best, good, above-board practices. Then it's examined by an independent board of directors. That's just good policy, and Paul is making sure that when he's handling the finances or this group is handling the finances, that they're all above reproach. And he's assuring them of that. Verse 23, if anyone inquires about Titus, they go, well, who is this Titus character anyway? He's collecting all this money from the church here. He is my partner, I vouch for him. Fellow worker concerning you, I've asked him, I've commissioned him to be the emissary with you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they, the unnamed brothers, are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Paul bragged about the Corinthians to the Macedonians. Now, he's, bag he's bragging to the Corinthians about the Macedonians, but he's saying, I bragged about you, Corinthians, to the Macedonians. I boasted of you. I want to make sure my bragging and boasting of you was not in vain. So a year ago, you said, oh, count me in. You know, we love the church in Jerusalem. They've given us so much. Prove it. That's, that's what he's saying here. I show to them the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So, look, I don't want to force you. I don't want to command you. But prove your love. I've always loved this story. It's a true story. Back in the 1900s, early 1900s, there was a, a pastor down in Texas, down in Dallas area, named Pastor George Truitt. Because it was Dallas, Texas, there were and are lots of wealthy people in that area, in that state. 
And George Truitt, the pastor, was invited over to a wealthy man's estate uh, far away from town, a large spread of land where his house is right in the middle of it. Pastor went out there for dinner, and uh, after dinner, the uh, businessman took him to the top story and pointed out toward the fields in all directions. And he said, I came to this country so many years ago without a penny. Now I own everything in that direction, everything in that direction, everything in that direction, and everything in that direction. And George Truett simply put his arm, his hand on the man's shoulder, pointed up, and said, how much do you own in that direction? Are you laying up treasure for yourself in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's just, it's a, just a good story and a good reminder that we give ourselves to the Lord, we belong to him, thus he has access to everything. So he, he, in so many words, is telling them that. And he continues with that thought now into chapter 9, which is a very short chapter. Now concerning the ministry to the saints, that is the saints in Jerusalem, the financial offering that we're concerning the ministry to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. A couple geographical notes. Again, Macedonia is the area of Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. Achaia was southern Greece, and the area of Corinth on that little isthmus of land called the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Say that fast ten times. Peloponnesian Peninsula. Okay. No, don't, 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 don't really have to do that. But uh, so that, that's Achaia. That's that region. So the churches in Macedonia, churches in Achaia, which included Corinth, a year ago, this has been in the making. Now, here's a question. He keeps mentioning this year lapse this year interval you know okay paul you want an offering for the poor saints in jerusalem why didn't you just take it a year ago why this delay i don't exactly know but i'll just give you my thought um i think paul would have i think it took a year for the corinthians to get ready for it remember one of the things that was notable about the corinthian church was their low spiritual level they were a carnal church, 1 Corinthians 2 and 3. He writes to them, you're carnal. And in their carnality, a couple may have voiced their desire, yeah, this is a good thing to get involved in, but it took that long to ramp them up to the follow-through. could simply be that that low spiritual level, um, it, it just took some time to overcome. You see, if you're not a spiritual church, you're not a generous church. But I have discovered that the more spiritual a person is, the more generous that person becomes. It's why it's such an honor to minister among y'all. You're spiritual. And you show, you prove your level of spirituality by all of the projects that we have done through the years and how you have lavishly given to people over in the Ukraine, people down in Africa, or projects with Reload Love. You've, you've done that. It took Corinth a little bit longer. Yet, verse 3, I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me, and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. So Paul's saying, look, I am coming. I promise you that I'm coming. And he explained in the early chapters why the delay. But I'm coming. And some Macedonians may be coming with me. Remember, Paul is in Macedonia when he writes this, probably in Philippi, perhaps Thessalonica or Berea. But he's in Macedonia. He has told them, I'm coming. Some of the Macedonians might be coming, and I've been bragging on you. Boy, it would be embarrassing for you. 
after all the boasting that I made to them about you, if you guys weren't ready in this. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and to prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it might be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now that's a spiritual as well as a physical law. It's a physical law. It's a law of nature. A farmer, if he has a little bit of seed, can expect a little outcome. If he has a lot of seed and a lot of work he puts into it, he can expect a greater outcome. It's the law of the harvest. It's also a spiritual law. It's true in the spiritual realm. You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. When I was a kid, my parents had a, a garden, and it was a, it was a half an acre garden. And in one little area, they had a lot of asparagus and they had a lot of other things, but they had just a few watermelons. They sowed sparingly. And so we got a few watermelons. But every summer, my mom and dad would go to the grocery store and buy watermelons and bring them home. And there were four Heitzig boys who would eat the, my mom, go outside and eat that watermelon. You'll make a mess inside. So we'd go outside by the fence and we'd eat our watermelon and we'd spit the seeds over the fence. And we sowed bountifully. And the next year, a whole bunch more watermelons came out. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. That's a spiritual law as well as a physical law. It's a law not only that Paul brings up, it's a law found in the Old Testament and also found in the words of Jesus. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, much the same thing. Maybe this is where Paul even got it from. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give to your bosom. Now, we hear that, and it doesn't make logical sense. You're saying that if I give, that I'll actually receive more? No, it sounds, that doesn't sound logical. What I know to be logical is the more I give, the less I have. The point is, you can never outgive God. You can never outgive God. And that is something Jesus said, given it will be given to you. God will figure a way to get it back to you somehow. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Now, that is also an Old Testament law. It's found in Proverbs. Proverbs 11, I marked out. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. This is Proverbs eleven twenty four. There's one who scatters, yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. That's Proverbs 11. Further back in Proverbs 3, it tells us, Honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will will overflow with new wine. All those verses, scriptures, places have the same truth. 2 Corinthians, Luke 6, Proverbs 3, Proverbs chapter 11. It's a spiritual law. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So, so, verse 7, let each one give as he purposes in his heart not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I've told you before the word cheerful means hilarious. 
the most hilarious part of the church service should be receiving the offering. Joyful. So, notice in verse 7, you can be a sad giver, grudgingly. You can be a mad giver of necessity, or you can be a glad giver. God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. I was reading this morning in my devotions Something interesting. I knew it was there, but I went to look at it again. It's found in Exodus 25. And it's the place in the Old Testament where when God moves the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness, he tells Moses, get the elders together and tell the children of Israel to bring an offering to me. So God takes an offering. In in Exodus 25, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone. Listen to this. Here's the stipulation. From everyone who gives it willingly, with his heart, you shall take my offering. So that's chapter 25. Then he gives instructions of what they're to do with that money, build a tabernacle. So in chapter 35 of Exodus, 10 chapters later, so Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, bronze, and all of these other items. Verse 20 of chapter 35, The congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone whose heart was stirred, everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all of its works and service and holy garments. They came, both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. Verse 29, the children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord, all the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring the material for all kinds of work. Then in the next chapter, chapter 36, is the last thing I'll read to you. In verse 4, Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work that he was doing, and they spoke to Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment and caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. Can you imagine? Their hearts were so willing, they gave too much. And Moses and the gang had to finally say, Stop giving. That's probably the only time in recorded history where that has happened. I don't think it's happened since. You know, we often say generosity multiplies capacity. There's always needs that we see for uh, finances to be used to spread the work and, and, and uh, the word of God. But here, for this offering, enough was enough. And so they were restrained from giving. So Not grudgingly, not of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able uh, to make all sufficiency abound in all work. As it is written, now he's quoting Psalm 112, back to 2 Corinthians 9. We'll finish out chapter 9. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality or generosity which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many to thanksgivings to God. 
People everywhere were going, praise God, praise God, bless the Lord, thank you, Lord. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. As we bring these two chapters, just letting you get that soaked in, two chapters tonight, as we bring this to a close, uh, let's close this by, by acknowledging that there are probably four ways you can give. You can give out of duty because you have to. Tax season is here. Um, I don't know anybody who goes, I can't wait for tax season. I really have a willing heart. I want to give my, the, my government more of my money. I don't think I've ever heard that. And I don't think I've ever felt that. I don't feel that. I don't think that. I give out of duty. I do it, but I give out of duty. That's one way to do it, out of duty. Some people, secondly, give out of self-satisfaction. They do it because it ameliorates, it satiates a need they have. They feel guilty when they see something. Oh, I feel so much better now that I've, I've done that, I've given that. Self-satisfaction. I guess it's better than duty, but not much. A third reason to give is prestige. Um, it increases my reputation. People know that I'm a generous person. And some people even uh, attach a stipulation. Oh, I'd love to give this much money if you just put a plaque in the foyer that says I donated this wing. The fourth purest reason to give is out of love, out of love. Where it's not an obligation, it's an opportunity, a grace. I love God, I wanna, I love God's people. I, I wanna get involved in this endeavor. And let's finish it. And by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you and then he's talking probably about the gift of money that is going to be given to Jerusalem. But he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You could also say that's true of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When you love someone, you give. God so loved the world that he gave and he gave his best. He gave his son. That's God's style to give his best. Have you received his best? Have you received his gift? Have you received eternal life? Have you received salvation? Not all of those in Corinth evidently had. We saw that earlier in this letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, that not all of them who were of that assembly were necessarily born again. And so... We're talking about giving, but as we close, let's just touch on receiving God's gift to you, if you haven't done that. So let's, with that thought, bow in, in prayer. Father, we, first of all, give ourselves to you, our bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is our spiritual act of worship, our reasonable service. And because we give ourselves to you, you by necessity, have access to everything that you have blessed us with in the material realm. It's really not ours. We're just stewards of your blessing. But, Father, as we close, there may be one or two or some who are here, some who are tuning in, watching across the country or across the world, who have yet to receive Jesus Christ as the gift you gave for their sin. You said in your word, as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power, the privilege to become children of God. And so, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would activate life change in people who have not yet done that. Oh, they've come to church and we're glad they did, but they haven't come to you. 
They haven't come to the cross. And so, Father, would you open up that heart or those hearts to receive the gift? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. If you're here this evening in this auditorium and you have not yet received personally, though you maybe grew up in a church, you haven't personally received Christ. You haven't said yes to him as your Lord and Savior. You've seen others who have, but you haven't made it personal yourself. But you're willing to. You're here. You're willing to. God has been dealing with you. And you're at a place where you know you need to surrender your life to Jesus. If you're willing to do that, or if you've strayed away from him and you need to come back to him. If that identifies you, if that describes you, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I want you to raise your hand up in the air and say, that's me and I, I want to give my life to Christ. Raise your hand up and you're saying, Skip, look at my hand, acknowledge my hand, pray for me. And I would love to pray for you, I just need to know who it is I'm praying for. So just slip that hand up in the air and you're saying, Tonight is the night. God bless you. Yes, sir. And you in the balcony. Anybody else? Anyone else? Raise that hand up. Raise it up. Father, for those who did, Father, we pray that your spirit would continue that work in these lives. And wherever you are, if you raised your hand, would you just say, a simple word of prayer right where you're seated. Just say, Lord, come into my life. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe you sent him. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to rejoice together and sing together. After we're done with this song, those I saw a hand in the balcony, a couple hands down here on the floor. I want you to do something. And again, I'm not going to command you, but I'm going to advise you. Like Paul, I advise you to come after the service to our decision team. They're going to be up front. You'll, you'll spot them. They'll have badges, signs, and smiles. And walk up to one of them and say, I raised my hand. I prayed that prayer. We want to welcome you into God's family. We want to place something in your hands, a Bible, give you next steps, and, and walk with you into the future. Okay, so if you raised your hand and you prayed that prayer, come to one of our decision team members and say that. If you're watching online and you made that decision, if you have a phone, you can text five, text LIFE, the word LIFE, L-I-F-E, to 505-509-5433. Uh, That's 505-509-5433. Text the word LIFE uh, to that telephone number and somebody will be there to reach out to you. Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound.